Hi everyone and welcome to the role of photos and videos as evidence of human rights abuses. This webinar is part of ETEC's Empowerment and Accountability Programme, assisting advocates from the victim communities and their supporters in their work. I'm Victoria, your host for today. We are very pleased to have Wendy Betts as our speaker today. During Wendy's presentation, please feel welcome to write questions that come to mind in the Q&A that you will see on your screen. After the presentation, Wendy will have time to address any questions that you may have. Wendy is a director of Eyewitness to Atrocities, an organization that combines law and technology to promote accountability for serious international crimes. The Eyewitness system allows human rights documenters to capture videos and photos of human rights violations that can easily be authenticated by a court. Wendy previously served as the director of the American Bar Association War Crimes Documentation Project. She has written and presented on topics related to human rights documentation, international criminal law, digital evidence and accountability. Wendy has an MA in International Relations and International Economics from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a JD from the University of San Francisco, San Francisco School of Law. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Victoria. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Wendy Betts and I direct Eyewitness to Atrocities. We are a charity based in London uh, that was initiated by the International Bar Association. I'm really honored to be with here, here with you today, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, uh, whatever time it is where you are. Let me give you first a brief outline of what I plan to discuss with you today. First, I will explain a bit about who Eyewitness is and what we do. Then I'll move to some of the challenges to using digital photo and videos as evidence, and then some of the requirements for photo and video to be admissible as evidence in a court. Then we will look at some tech and non-tech based approaches to collecting and verifying photos and videos, and then we'll finish with some security considerations. So first about eyewitness, as Victoria mentioned, Eyewitness combines law and technology to promote accountability for the worst international crimes. So by worst international crimes, I'm referring here to crimes such as genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So we work with human rights organizations around the world to help them improve the potential evidentiary value of the information they are collecting about human rights violations. So the eyewitness approach is based on three pillars. First, we provide a free mobile app to use to capture photo and video. Then all footage taken with the eyewitness app is embedded with information at the moment that footage is captured that helps to verify where and when the footage was taken and to demonstrate that it has not been altered. Second pillar is when users send footage to the eyewitness server a record is created of who had access to the information that was captured. This demonstrates that the original information has not been changed in any way. And third, all footage that we receive is reviewed by a team of lawyers who process this visual evidence to meet the requirements of investigators. So then with the consent of the organizations that collected it, Eyewitness provides the footage and the analysis to those actors who can use this information to hold the perpetrators of violations accountable. So because Eyewitness works exclusively with photo and video information, I'm going to focus my remarks on this medium. However, even though I am speaking about photo and video, it's important to bear in mind that this is only one of many types of information that is needed to prove these types of crimes. I also want to recognize that I know the violations suffered by Falun Gong practitioners and the Uyghur population often occur inside controlled facilities, such as detention centers, labor camps, or hospitals, and it may be difficult to film in these environments. So where possible to obtain photo and video, they can be very helpful 
but they are not the only sources of evidence. There are also witness statements, official documents, physical evidence that will all be needed to prove what violations are taking place. So looking first at the challenges uh, to using photo and video as evidence, going back to the history of eyewitness, the idea for eyewitness arose in 2011. And this is when we were seeing the combination of the rise of social media platforms, such as Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as the proliferation of smartphones, meaning increasingly ordinary citizens had the power to report on what was happening around them. So as a result, human rights defenders are able to capture and share information about events on the ground in real time. And individuals working in the justice sector recognize the tremendous potential of this footage as a source of firsthand real-time information collected at a point before professional investigators have access to the scene. But while this footage helped to raise awareness of violations that were occurring, it was difficult, if not impossible, to use that footage as actual evidence to hold the perpetrators of these violations accountable. The benefit of digital footage is it's very easy to capture and share. However, as we've also learned, it's also very easy to manipulate and share. So even though your mobile phone might capture where and when you recorded a photo, that information can be stripped from the footage or can be changed as it passed to others or posted online. Similarly, the footage itself can be edited to remove or add important details, to add incriminating information, or to change the order of events. So without being able to trace the provenance of the footage, it's difficult to determine if the footage is authentic. So let me show you an example here. I'm going to share my screen and show you a photo that has been circulated widely online. So this photo has <coughs> been circulated widely on the internet purporting to be various events. I should say uh, that the photo shows a scene that's quite graphic. So uh, at the bottom, we've blurred it out on purpose, but what the photo is showing uh, are scores of badly burned bodies. So this photo has been put forth as evidence of a massacre uh, in various countries in Africa, and as well as evidence of a massacre halfway around the world in Myanmar. In reality, what this photo shows is the aftermath of a fuel tank explosion in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So without knowing definitively where and when this photo was taken, it can be alleged to be anything, anywhere. And this problem is even more acute with the growing capacity and accessibility of deepfake technology. So let me give you an example. The photo I showed you previously was an example of just misattribution of an actual photo, whether for benign or malicious reasons. But now artificial intelligence can be used to create entirely fake footage using publicly available photos and videos. So what you see on the screen here is an example of a deep fake. The image on the left is a clip from an actual speech given by former US President Barack Obama, whereas the image on the right is a screenshot from an entirely computer-generated speech that he never gave. So while it's tempting to think that photos and videos speak for themselves, the examples I just gave show <clears throat> that that's really not necessarily the case. So for footage to be used in court, a judge has to determine that it's trustworthy. And in order to convince a judge of this, the information must meet rigorous standards before it can be deemed as evidence. So look, let's look at those requirements. There are two main criteria for information to be considered admissible evidence. It needs to first be relevant, and then second, to be reliable. So first, relevance looks at whether the footage is going to help the court determine whether a disputed fact is more or less likely to be true. So relevance is getting to the content of the footage. In other words, what information is being captured in that camera frame? That footage should show that elements of the crime are being met. So either certain conduct took place, certain accused individuals were present, or other types of information that are needed to prove the elements of crimes. The second factor, reliability, relates to the authenticity of the footage. So is the item what it purports to be? 
And when we're talking about digital footage, we have to look at three key aspects to help show that it's authentic. So first, was the footage taken where and when it was claimed? Second, is the footage unedited? So in other words, is its integrity intact? Is it still in its original form? And third, is there a record that accounts for who had access to that information from the time it was created? In legal terms, this concept is referred to as chain of custody. As the footage passes from hand to hand, so for example, from the photographer to an investigator to a court, it's creating a chain. If that chain is broken, meaning if there's a gap in knowing who had access to that footage at some point, then that footage is going to be considered more suspect because it could have been changed or modified during that time. So when you look at approaches to collection and verification, you need to be looking at approaches that can address these indicia of authenticity. So two different but related tracks of work have developed over the past decade to address these challenges to demonstrating the authenticity of photos and videos so that they can be used as evidence. And these approaches are both tech-based and non-tech based. So the first approach has been the creation of tools for human rights defenders to use to ensure that the authenticity of the footage they collect. Now these tools are called controlled capture tools and that's because they're recording and embedding information needed to demonstrate authenticity at the moment the image is captured. The second track that has developed is new methodologies and procedures to verify and authenticate footage that has been captured using standard mobile cameras and circulated online. So at Eyewitness, we pursued the first track. The Eyewitness app is what is known as a controlled capture tool. Eyewitness is then, of course, a tech-based solution to the collection issue. So what the Eyewitness app does is to record where and when the footage was taken in a way that does not rely on the photographer to provide the information and cannot be changed by the photographer or by another third party. So we are collecting the latitude and longitude and the date and time using the phone's GPS sensors. Additionally, the app is recording nearby Wi-Fi networks and range. We can then look up the IDs of those networks in a commercial database that provides the physical location of the networks. So we can then get their latitude and longitude as well. And then finally, the app is recording the identification number of nearby cell towers. These similarly, we can look up in a commercial database and plot their physical location. So once this information is collected on the device, it's stored encrypted on the phone, which means that someone trying to read the file would only see a series of random symbols rather than the actual readable text. Now the benefit of this approach is that we are no longer reliant on the user to be providing the information about where and when the footage was captured. This information is collected automatically and in a way that can't be altered. Additionally, because this information is collected from three independent sources, it's very difficult to fake. So these features combine address that first aspect of authenticity that I mentioned, which is knowing where and when the footage was taken. The app then is also designed to ensure the footage itself cannot be edited. The images are stored encrypted on the device inside a secure gallery inside the app. There are no editing features in this gallery. And so the app user can see a thumbnail of their footage, but they cannot access the original file. Then the app is also creating a digital fingerprint for the image at the moment it's recorded. This fingerprint is an alphanumeric code called a hash value. If any changes were made to the footage at any point, they would be identifiable because they would then in turn change the hash value. So these features put together address the second aspect of authenticity, which is knowing that the footage is in its original form. Then once the footage has been recorded, the app user uploads a copy of their footage to a server that Eyewitness maintains. This transmission is sent encrypted, so it cannot be intercepted or accessed. So the design of the app with the footage stored encrypted on the device, 
the method of transmission to our server, where again, the footage is traveling encrypted, and then our storage protocols, once the footage is in our possession, allow us to trace the lifespan of the footage from the time it was created by the app until it is used in an investigation or goes to court. So in other words, we are creating and maintaining the chain of custody, which addresses the third aspect of authentication that I mentioned. Now there's one component of reliability that cannot be addressed by technology, and that is whether the content of the footage is what it's purported to be. So for example, there could be accusations that the scene had been staged or that the events may be something entirely different from what they appear. So if you recall back to the photo I showed you of the fuel tank explosion, that has been shared, uh, alleged to be footage of various massacres. So the context in which the photo is taken is key. Now, eyewitness does not verify the context uh, and whether it's what it appears to be. So we're focused on the other three indicia of reliability. So we leave that job of verifying the context to professional investigators. However, for footage to be used as evidence, that confirmation really is vital for that footage to go to court. So I said I would discuss some non-tech-based approaches because I recognize that not everyone will be able to use a tech tool like eyewitness. Either it's a, not a conducive environment to, to be filming publicly with a, with a mobile device, um, there, there may be difficulties in access um, or other reasons. So <clears throat> we know for sure that there have already been photos collected using standard mobile cameras and, and are in circulation, and there will continue to be photos collected in this way in the future. So I want to touch upon some other manual approaches to verification. So even if you don't have access to a specialized app, there's three points I want to make. The first, there are still ways to collect information that can help show that the footage is authentic. Second, there are ways to verify footage that has already been collected. And third, most importantly, even if footage may not be admissible in court, it can still be valuable to investigations. So let me say a little bit more about each of these three topics. So first, in terms of tips for collecting information, there are a number of organizations that provide guidance on how to record photo and video in a way that can help investigators to authenticate your footage. So I've tried to compile some of their tips here to share with you today. So first, ensure your camera or cell phone is set to the correct uh, date, time, and GPS location so that the metadata is recorded. So at least there's a starting point of valid information. Another thing you can do in case that information gets separated from the footage is you can actually record in the footage your voice saying the date, time, and location. Now, if this is impossible because you can't speak in the context in which you're recording, you can also write the time, date, and location on a piece of paper and hold it up for the camera for 10 seconds. And even if any of these aren't possible and you're still unable to add some of that basic information to the recording itself, you can create a separate document that summarizes the key information about your footage. But be sure to do this while the details are still fresh in your mind and ensure that you can keep that together with the footage. Now I recognize that these methods still rely on the veracity of the photographer then, but it will at least give investigators a starting point for verifying your footage. Another approach you can take that doesn't involve uh, the photographer's input is filming things that might show the date, time, and location. So for example, a clock, the front page of a newspaper, a street sign, a landmark, or other geographic feature that might give a more objective uh, clue as to when and where that footage was filmed. And then looking at chain of custody, this is a bit more detailed, but there are manual approaches to doing this as well. So one thing you can do if you're the photographer yourself, once you take that footage, you can save it onto the SD card, remove the SD card from the phone. You can put it in a sealed package that, that is wrapped up with tape. You sign and date over the seal, and then you can store that someplace where people don't have access. So for example, it's safe. Then at that point, up until when the seal is broken, it can help validate that no one has had access to change that footage from the time it was put into that sealed container. 
So those are just some examples of manual ways that you can help include information with the footage when it's collected that can help verify the authenticity. So then looking at how do you verify photos that have already been collected? So there may be a number of photos that haven't used any of these methods to help determine where it when it was taken, uh, but the content of it appears to indicate a violation is occurring. So as I mentioned, there's an entire new field developing around what is called open source investigation. So open source means basically information that is accessible to the public. For example, because you can find it online, such as social media posts, or you can purchase it, such as satellite photos. Now this is a very broad category of information, but it does include photos and videos that may be posted by activists or others. One of the leading organizations doing work in this area is the Human Rights Center at the University of California at Berkeley Law School. So they have recently published a protocol on open source investigations, which compiles and sets out current international best practices for this field. So I'm going to show you a screenshot quickly of that protocol so that uh, if you are interested, you can look up. Uh, more information. I highly recommend this resource, the, the Berkeley Protocol on Digital Open Source Investigations. So there are a number of other organizations such as Amnesty International Citizen Evidence Lab that also specialize in open source verification and preservation and have courses and other tools. So I would point you to those resources as well if you're interested in, in really knowing how to verify footage. But I'll give you a few examples of some of the techniques that can be used. There's various techniques to help show where and when footage was taken and whether it has been edited. And these range from fairly straightforward to much more complicated analyses. So one thing you can do, the, probably the most apparent, is to look for visual clues, such as landmarks, signs, license plates, and others to help geolocate the footage based on language, based on script use, based on, on landmarks you can identify. Then moving to more sophisticated methods, if for example you know the location and the date an image was taken, you can use a process called of shadow analysis to help identify the time of day. So you can measure the lengths of the shadows appearing in the footage and help determine the time. And there's information online about how to go about doing this process. And another resource is a number of programs that allow you to conduct a reverse image search of a digital photo. So these searches can help you identify earlier postings of this same photo, which may show that the photo is not what it's claimed. So for example, I'll show you now the example I gave you earlier with the fuel tank explosion in the Congo. So if you were to do a reverse image search of that, you will see that it has come up in a number of different articles, and the different articles are all where it's purported to be different types of events. So you can go back to see where the first appearance of that photo might have been and what it was reported to be. Uh, another thing that reverse image search can help you do is identify the source of the original postings. You might be able to identify the photographer or the person who put it online who would then have more details about and more context about that photo. And then some programs can even identify other photos that have been posted online that show the same of individuals that appear in the original photo. So there's a variety of tools around searching for photos that come into your possession. And then from there, there's methods that range into much more sophisticated forensic analysis where you're looking frame by frame for edits and other types of methods you can use. But no matter what you're using, it's always going to be important to try to identify the source of the information and evaluate their credibility and impartiality. So the third point I wanted to make in, in this section is what I mentioned earlier, is that the footage is still valuable to investigators, even if it can't be admitted as evidence in trial. So even if you're not able to collect it in a way that helps to indicate its authenticity, even if you're not able to do some of these sophisticated analyses to verify the footage 
but it does seem to be very relevant to a violation taking place. There are many other roles that photo and video can play in the investigative process, and some of them have lower standards for proof of the evidence, and so it can be very useful. So one example of a role that footage can play is as trigger evidence. So this means it helps to initiate or to trigger an investigation by showing conduct that if proven would be criminal. So it raises awareness of the violations going on and it helps show that there's conduct that requires further investigation. Another incredibly important role that footage can play, even if it can't go to trial, is what is called lead evidence. So this means it's providing information that can lead investigators to other pieces of evidence that might be admissible. So for example, a photo or video might show a witness, a victim, a perpetrator, or a location. And even if that photo itself can't be admitted as evidence, it's now helped investigators to know the identity of others who might have further information, or a location where a crime may have taken place that they can then go and investigate further. And another example of a role that the footage can play is as corroboration. So this means it can help corroborate or support information from other sources, such as human rights reports or witness statements, which helps then to lend weight to those pieces of evidence. So there's a variety of ways the footage can be useful all through the investigative process. But before we think about how we can use it, I want to now get to the final section I mentioned and address some of the security concerns around collecting and using the footage. So Eyewitness does not provide physical or cybersecurity advising ourselves. So what I'm going to do is outline some important considerations that are related to security. However, I would direct you to other organizations that do specialize in this area if you want to get concrete advice on practices, tools, specific apps, or specific platforms to use. But in terms of the general considerations, the first step that any security organization is going to tell you to do before filming should always be a risk assessment. And this assessment, obviously, you would evaluate the risk to yourself or through the person filming. However, it's really important to keep in mind that you're also evaluating the risk to the people being filmed and the communities that are affected. Because footage can place family or colleagues of the person being filmed in danger, even if those people don't appear in the footage. It can put other community leaders in danger. It could put your friends and family in danger. So you have to think of the broader picture of who might be put at risk. Then when doing the assessment, you need to look not only at the process of filming itself, which generally often can be quite dangerous, but then further down the chain of how this information will be stored once it's captured, with whom will it be shared, how will it be shared, and how will its security remain intact through all those processes. So for example, when storing information, it's important to remember that the security of the data encompasses not only keeping it safe from detection so that the filmer and the others appearing in it will remain safe, but also preserving the integrity of the information itself to make sure that it can go on to speak as some type of evidence. Also, if sharing the footage, then you need to take into consideration the dignity and the privacy of those that are appearing in the footage as a component of the, their security. And what's really key is to have their consent of those who have been filmed before sharing the footage with a third party where that's practical and, and feasible. One thing you might consider if you're sharing the information publicly is to use an obscuring tool or other methods of protecting people's identities. Um, and there's various approaches out there um, to help you do that. The other consideration I would note is that these considerations involve not only photos and videos you have filmed or are about to go film, but they also involve photos that you may have found online. So I think it's easy to think that uh, because you found it online, this footage was already in the public domain, some of these considerations don't apply. But even though the footage is already public, that may not have been the original intention when the footage was filmed. And so if it was posted online without consent, 
um, <clears throat> or has passed through many hands before it made it online, sharing it further may actually compound the risks to, again, the person who filmed it, the people appearing in the footage, the people in the affected community. Um, so I would, again, direct you to look for Human Rights Defenders Digital Security Organizations. If you look for that online, you'll come up with various organizations that have very specific toolkits for um, types of tools that you can use to maintain your cyber and digital security, uh, ethical considerations, checklists, protocols, and, and other things that you can employ to make sure that when you're capturing footage, when you're storing it, when you're sharing it, um, all the, the components of do no harm are covered. And I would just say that one point we do emphasize with eyewitness app users is that photo and video are only part of a larger evidentiary puzzle. There's not a single photo or video that's going to prove the case, so it may not be worth the risk to film. So, as I've said before, where possible to film, it can be helpful, and that footage can play a variety of roles in helping to demonstrate the violations taking place. Um, but sometimes foregoing filming is the best option because again, the ongoing safety of the photographer, those being filmed, and those in the affected community really is always the priority. So I think I'll end it there and uh, start to take questions. Uh, we've already had some coming in. So um, the first question we have is, after the footage is stored in the eyewitness app, can it be sent to someone and retain its integrity? So is it encrypted when it's sent? And specifically, if the people in the footage are worried about the safety or the person filming is worried about safety, will the information all be encrypted? So it's a really good question. Again, going back to the, the security topics I just ended with. Um, in terms of the eyewitness system, so if you filmed the, the footage with the eyewitness app, after the original is sent to eyewitness for safeguarding, the app user can share a copy with their network. So while it's in the eyewitness system, it certainly is encrypted at rest on the device and in transmission to us, um, and a secure copy remains stored encrypted. Um, but then once you are sharing it with your network, this copy no longer has the metadata attached to it, so the information about where and when it was taken, and is no longer encrypted by the app. It's outside the system. So the chain of custody is not automatically protected. So in that case, it's going to be up to the user to protect the security of the information once they've moved it out of the eyewitness system. So for example, by storing it to their device um, or, or sending it uh, to their network. So that should be stored and sent in an encrypted format or using whatever other tools you're using to protect your uh, digital and cyber security. So again, here's where it's really important for the user to have done a, a risk assessment about how to store and share the information. So, um, uh, good question. Why is iWitness not on the Apple Store, um, and will this issue be resolved? Um, this is going to be a, a difficult crowd to sell <laughs> this point to. So, we uh, have produced it only for Android um, for the last few years, and that's because the vast majority of the market share of mobile devices and smartphones uh, really is held by Android, and particularly in most of the contexts where we work, most of the human rights defenders are using Android devices rather than uh, iPhones. And so we haven't built an iOS version. It's something we're regularly evaluating um, and, and looking into the expense of. It's something we have contemplated again this year. So um, it's possible we, we might soon um, engage in, in developing an iOS version. Um, but at the moment, we, we've only been using Android because that is the vast majority. Now, I understand there are, there are certain pockets, um, certainly uh, China being one, um, but other pockets uh, of places where we, we might have partners um, that, that do use iPhones. But again, the vast majority is Android, so that's why. Um, so you mentioned image searching to see if an image exists online and has previously been claimed as something else. Does this search also work with videos? And is a search tool available freely online? How do we access it? Um, I, I believe they do work with videos. Um, I've, I'll, I'll be honest, I've only checked with 
images, but I think they do work with videos as well. Google has one, Bing has one. So the search engines do have one. They're not quite as good as some of the others that are available. Um, so you can look, depending on what you're trying to use it for and, and what you're trying to ascertain with it, you can look at the various versions that exist out there. But certainly the search engine ones are free. I think some of the others um, that are out there are free. Um, there's probably about half a dozen or so. So um, if you just Google reverse image search tools, you can easily pull up a list of, of the ones that are available. Um, and I think, I think some of the other organizations that do online um, open source investigation also might have some recommendations for those tools as well. Um, another question that has come in is if someone has footage filmed on the eyewitness app regarding Uyghur Falun Gong atrocities, to whom should they send it? So again, if it's filmed with the eyewitness app, the way the system works is the photographer can then send it directly to eyewitness using the upload function that exists inside the app. So with any footage we receive, we catalog it and tag it, analyze it, and then we seek out what investigative bodies might be in a position to act further on that footage. And then in collaboration, or at least with the consent of the, the individual organization that posted it, if they've provided us contact information, we will share that forward. Now, in terms of a copy that you might save for yourself or share within your network, if the question is to whom should it be sent, that's going to need to be, I think, determined in part by the risk assessment and what consent the subjects of the photo have given. Um, so looking at things like can the person or entity with whom it's being shared or sent to keep the information safe, will that person share it further and with whom, will those people keep it safe? Um, so there's a variety of questions you would need to ask around that. Um, to make that determination. Um, can you speak to the success of this app in real life? Um, sure, so we have used the app, we launched it publicly in 2015. So it's been used um, around the world. We have compiled 21 photo and video dossiers that we have given to investigative bodies at different levels. So we've provided information to the International Criminal Court, We've provided information to the UN, um, all of this again on behalf of our partner organizations. And we've provided information to national level prosecutors uh, in different locations. So we have had an instance in 2018 where footage taken with the app has gone to trial. This was in a case in the Democratic Republic of Congo involving two senior militia leaders who were uh, arrested and charged for crimes against humanity. Uh, for relation of their role uh, in a massacre that took place in 2012. So photos uh, taken with the app were used to help corroborate um, information about what had happened at the scene, to take photos of the mass grave, take photos of uh, the scarring of the injuries uh, of the victims, and those photos were entered into evidence and admitted by the court. So we do have an example of the system working. Um, and, and the footage being admitted as evidence. And we have examples of, again, footage going into various aspects of that investigative process that I mentioned. Um, there's a question about whether the app is officially accredited. Um, I'm not sure what accreditation exactly um, to, that you're referring to, um, but I can say that we do do regular penetration and vulnerability tests. So we send it to a security company regularly to basically try to hack it and see if there's uh, any vulnerabilities they can find to make sure that the one that's put out to the public is always the most uh, up to date uh, in terms of uh, security measures. And then again, in terms of the use of the information as evidence, there's not a process by which uh, it can be given a seal of approval. It will always depend on the jurisdiction, how the information is being used, uh, uh, what uh, it's being used to prove, 
Um, but as I said, we have had information accepted as evidence into court, and we've had information accepted by other types of investigators at various levels. So um, we do know that the way in which the app is verifying the authenticity is, is trusted by investigators. Um, next. Oh, hackability, yes. So in, uh, accreditation in terms of security, yes. So we definitely um, have it penetration tested uh, regularly. So then uh, there's another question. Um, if we have original footage not filmed on Eyewitness, what is the best way to send it so that it's secure? Is there an app or online tool that can be used for sending it over signal good enough? Um, here, again, since, as I said before, since I'm not a cybersecurity expert, very hesitant to recommend a specific tool for you to use. Uh, certainly, you would want to use something encrypted, such as Signal, at the very minimum. Um, but again, I'd highly recommend that you look into some of the security toolkits that are developed specifically for human rights defenders to, to look at what they're recommending. These are also things that change quite regularly as different vulnerabilities are identified in tools and and um, other tools increase their security and, and patch vulnerabilities. So um, since we're not cybersecurity experts ourselves, I would point you in that direction. Um, there is another question. Can the eyewitness app be downloaded in China or can it be sent to people in China as an attachment in a message? How can they get it? That's a really good question because the primary way to get the app is by downloading it from the Google Play Store, which as I understand is blocked in China. Um, I have read that it may be possible to access it with a VPN, so perhaps that is one way, but you can also contact us directly for some other options um, that can involve transfer of the direct download file, so it doesn't have to be done from an online source. Um, another question has come in. Um, is it worthwhile filming injuries after people escape? This is a really good question. Um, photos of injuries can be very useful evidence. Um, but here's where I think some of that information I discussed about the risk assessment and informed consent is particularly important because of the implications for the privacy and the dignity of the, the injured party. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, photos are better than video um, in this case because they're less invasive and they actually help show the injuries um, in a way that can be better analyzed than video. Um, it's of course always better for the photos to be taken by a medical professional if possible, um, but if not, obviously that, that's not always possible. You should make clear that you're not um, when you're photographing the, the injured party. Um, refrain from photographing intimate areas. Um, it's good to, to have a sketch of where the injuries are, and on that sketch you can just indicate with an X that there, there may be another injury there that hasn't been filmed. Um, and then there's special techniques that you can use to help increase the investigative value of photos taken of injuries. So you're going to want to take full-length photos of the, of the full body where the injury occurred, so you can see where it is on the person, um, a medium range photo, and then a close up so that you can, can see the detail of the actual injury. Um, also for all of these shots, it's really helpful to place something next to the injury in the photo so that you can help show the scale. So if you have a ruler, fantastic, but if not, even a, a ballpoint pen or something else that's a familiar object that we all roughly understand the size of to help show um, the, the extent of those injuries. Um, if footage is filmed on the app and then the phone is lost or confiscated by authorities, can the footage be accessed from the app by the eyewitness staff? So we can't uh, reach into the phone to, to access any of that footage. So if footage has not been uploaded to us, um, then there is no way to access it. Um, so we have two options for uploading so that the user can choose whether they want to upload it manually so that they can wait until they're in a location where they have Wi-Fi, um, where it might be safer, they have more time, they can maybe add some notes about the context and upload it. Or if they are using the app in a location where they are connected to the internet, 
and are worried about the phone being confiscated or lost, you can set it to auto upload so they go up immediately. And then in that case, we will already have them. But we allow the users to remain anonymous. And for that reason, we don't have a way to reach back in to the, a person's phone um, because we, we don't have a way to communicate that way back to a phone. The communication only goes from the phone to us. And so um, we also want to, to leave the agency to the person to decide what photos are going to come to us so we don't extract anything. So I recognize there's a trade-off there that might mean that some footage is lost, but to ensure the, the anonymity where it's requested or the agency of the user, we want to make sure that the, the user is in control of when those photos go. Um, and in that respect, there are some security features to the app that help you delete it quickly if you are in a situation where you think arrest or confiscation might be imminent. So again, if those photos haven't been sent, they're lost, but what's more important that, that you, the person, is safe. So you can do an immediate emergency uninstall of the app, and it will delete the app and all of its contents. Um, another question, should testimonies of people who have escaped be filmed on the eyewitness app, and what caution should be taken when recording witness testimonies? Um, this is a really good question because this is a topic that's not really settled in the field of documentation and photo video documentation. Um, so I'm going to give you a two-part answer to that. So first, the eyewitness app itself is not designed for witness testimony. And one reason for this is that it doesn't actually help increase the evidentiary value because it's only showing you where and when that interview took place, not adding any weight to the content of the witness's statement, which is really the key information that, that you're, you're seeking. Uh, the second reason is a more technical one, and that's because since the footage is stored encrypted with all of its metadata about where and when it was taken, these files can become very large, especially on a mobile device. So filming is limited to a maximum of 10 minutes at a time. So this means it's not really conducive to filming a witness statement because first you're going to have to start and stop the recording over and over, which increases the trauma for the witness who's going to have to stop their story, then restart and stop and restart. Um, but also importantly, it gives the video the appearance of it having been edited. And so you certainly don't want that and any questions like that coming about the, the witness testimony. So the eyewitness app isn't um, intended for that type of use. Now, <clears throat> the second part of the answer is looking at whether you should be filming witness statements in general. So most professional investigators are going to give you a resounding no as the answer to that question. Their extreme preference is to receive written summaries of witness statements. However, there is a disagreement um, between civil society groups and the investigators because civil society groups tend to be the first responders. They have access to the witnesses while the information is still fresh in their mind. Um, they might have access um, that, that's not going to be available when investigators are able to, to finally do an investigation. So there's a fear that information could be lost. So there's pros and cons to both of these approaches. Um, so I would just, again, suggest that for anyone who's contemplating taking witness statements and contemplating whether to film them, uh, to consult with the various resources that exist about the best practices um, on this so that you can make an informed decision about which way you want to go. Um, <clears throat> so another question about the app, do users register? So if a user uploads that is inside a country such as China, can I witness use the footage and notes independent to the user? So <clears throat> there are various options. The users do register. But you, when you register, you have the option of whether or not you want to remain anonymous. So you can register with an alias and no contact details, in which case we have no idea who you are. Um, and then the trade-off for that is you are consenting for us to then use your footage in, in trying to, to seek out investigative bodies and share it with them. Now, the other end of the spectrum is you want to maintain some agency over that information. So you do register with an email address, in which case we will use that to try to contact you. Or in the notes, you can put a signal number, which again, we will use to try to contact you before we share it 
to seek your consent. So you can choose what level of engagement you want to have. We do often work in partnerships with human rights organizations that are focusing on specific issues or, or doing documentation. And then when we work with those groups, um, we usually have a written agreement where we have a contact point with those groups. We don't necessarily know who is within that group's network collecting information on the ground, um, but that information comes to us and then we work with the leadership of the human rights organization about how that footage can be used. So again, in collaboration and with consent in, in moving it forward. So, um, so you can either choose again to be anonymous and, and give us consent to go ahead and, and use that footage, um, share it forward, or give us contact details, in which case we will come back and seek your consent. So I think, are there any more questions? It looks like those are all that have come in. Um, if not, then I'll turn it back over to Victoria. Thank you, Wendy. I think those are all our questions. And I've certainly learned a lot from your presentation. I'm sure everyone watching will have also benefited greatly. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We will circulate a video of the webinar in the next few days, and you are most welcome to share it with members of your community. We will we'll also include links to ETAC's newly released explainer video, our new Instagram page where you'll find unique content and stories and information on advocacy initiatives you can support. If you are based in the US, please also let us know if you're interested to support the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Bill of 2021 that has recently been introduced with bipartisan support. Thank you again for attending and we look forward to engaging with you during our next webinar on documenting evidence. Thank you and see you all next time.